Hello, everyone. Uh, we will just wait one minute for, here they go. Here comes Katie um, and really, uh, I think you just have to unmute and we'll be good to go. Let's see, perfect. Hi guys, thanks for joining and thanks everyone in the audience for joining today. Um, I've lost count at this point, but I think this must be our 25th, I believe, version of Susie's State of Consumer webinar and the first in a four part series that we're calling industry superpowers, where we're going deep into four emerging industries that have been disrupted during the past year. And we're talking to industry experts and we really have two great ones today talking about where it is all headed. Um, and today we are talking about uh, personal finance and the shifting behaviors in personal finance. And I wanna introduce um, our two guests. Um, from two amazing uh, startups that are really uh, disrupting their category. Uh, first, uh, Raylene Kirk from Affirm. Um, Raylene, how are you? Thanks so much for joining today. I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. And how how are things at Affirm? How how is business going? I know you guys recently went public, so that must have been uh, you know a wild ride. And obviously, uh, your founder has a storied history um, in technology. Uh, what's it like working for a rocket ship uh, like Affirm? It's very much a rocket ship. Um, so uh, I was hired about a year and a half ago to lead our marketing research and consumer insights function. Um, a firm had hired their CMO a year before I got there. And um, as you may know, we are a pay over time installment loan company, um, really technology first. Um, our founder was previously one of the co-founders of PayPal. Um, really a firm's mission is to provide honest financial products for people. Um, we don't charge any late fees, no hidden fees, no compound interest. Um, but we, as many technology companies, needed to figure out how to market to consumers in a way that makes sense for them. And so yeah. um, my job here has been really to bring the consumer to the forefront of how we think about our messaging, our positioning, um, how we talk to them. So it's been a, a great wild ride. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited to hear some of your insights today, just given what you've experienced at a firm and how it really connects with some of the insights we've uncovered with our Suzy research. So, um, and our second guest is a very familiar face um, to the Suzy slash CrowdTap team because uh, Katie in her yesteryear actually used to be a rising star at CrowdTap and has then gone on uh, to do a lot of great things. So Katie, thanks so much for joining. Um, how is everything going at public.com? You're sort of like the face of public.com now. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for having me. Uh, lots of love for the Suzy crew. Uh, some of my most formidable years were there and really cool to see you all take off. Um, such an amazing product. Uh, yeah, I was the first marketing hire uh, at public.com. Um, I had known the CEO from my consulting days and just sort of fell in love with the mission and the product. What we're really trying to do is fundamentally change the culture around the stock market to make it more accessible, inclusive and educational. And so we've essentially built a mobile investing app that has a social media layer on it um, with a big focus on, on inclusion and broadening the investor class. So our community is actually 40% women, 45% people of color. And because we're kind of going after these audiences that are underserved and have been largely ignored by financial institutions, um, we're really going to market as a mass consumer brand. Uh, the goal is to make public famous, period. Not, you know, we don't want to be a hot fintech company or start uh, a startup in a small space. We want to build a mass consumer brand. Um, so if anyone's heard of GameStop, um, you can probably guess how our year's been going. It's been absolutely insane, but really cool to see investing crack into mainstream culture because that's really what is going to make this more accessible for more people. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge driver in mainstream culture. And obviously the pandemic was a huge, you know, accelerator of, you know, the retail investor embracing investing in the stock market. For a while, it wasn't really a cool thing uh, to do. I was actually... Um, headed to the airport for the first time in over a year last week. And the person that was sitting next to me, you know, was trading stocks. And, you know, it was just, it's something that you wouldn't normally see because this wasn't like a business person. It's somebody who was on leisure travel because uh, not a lot of people are doing business travel right now. And it, it just reminded me of how far we've come in terms of, uh, you know, investing and people being sort of mindful of their own personal finance 
sometimes to a, to a detriment, and we'll get into that, you know, but it's really front and center. So uh, thanks again for joining, Katie. I'm really excited to hear, obviously, your insights as well. So um, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, Suzy is a real-time market research platform uh, that helps over 300 leading brands uh, really make on-demand decisions with the help of your consumer. Consumer centricity is more important than ever before as sort of the conventional notions of what we've all believed that the consumer has really been thrown out the window uh, in the last year. And that's not changing anytime soon. So, you know, our customers are using Suzy for everything to roll out new products, to test pricing, to test creative, to get feedback from existing consumers. So if you have any questions about Suzy uh, at the end of this presentation, you can feel free to reach out to us um, uh, or you can ping me directly at mattb at suzy.com. Um, we used our Suzy tool for the research we're going to be covering today. We conducted a study over the Suzy platform on April 20th and 21st with a sample size of 1,000 Americans. Uh, the sample that we're going to be sort of alluding to today is direction representatives of consumers working from home and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So... Uh, with that, and Katie kind of mentioned GameStop, um, and one of your competitors, Robinhood, is here on this slide. And obviously, you know, they've been in the news probably more negative than positive um, this year, uh, but they've sort of been uh, the leader of the meme stock revolution, so to speak. And I think they're getting uh, a little bit spanked today in the stock market as they have over the last couple of weeks. And it kind of, to me, goes to show a couple of things. I believe right now we're living what I call the shortcut economy. I'm actually going to do a, a big um, post on this because I think one of the negatives that we've seen over the last year is that younger people, and I have a son that's 13 years old and he thinks that you can be a gazillionaire just trading cryptocurrency and it's just going to kind of happen. Uh, and I think many people believe whether it's NFTs or baseball cards or companies taking the side door and trying to go public via SPACs or this day trading with meme stocks like GameStop and AMC, that there's just an easy path to get rich, right? And you don't have to put in the work. You don't have to save over time. You don't have to buy and hold. It's just going to kind of happen for you. And I think one of the negative lessons it's teaching young people is that they don't have to work hard. They don't have to think about their future. And I think we're going to face a reckoning um, in our culture and our society in the stock market. We're already slowly starting to see it happen. We are undoubtedly within a massive bubble right now. And I'm curious from both of you, uh, because, you know, one's sort of on the investing side, Katie, and then railing sort of on the spending side, right? But two huge part of overall personal finance how you balance that, how you balance getting people to invest more, how to make spending easier, but at the same time, understand that, especially for younger people, you know, they have to be thinking long term about their financial well being. And, you know, I think this whole GameStop revolution is going to be looked upon in, in the rearview mirror is really a black eye on consumerism. And people are, have and will continue to lose a lot of money because they don't want to buy stocks like Apple and, and sit on it or GE and sit on and hold it. They want to, and, and there is a place in the world for day trading and instant profits, but I think it's kind of, uh, you know, jump the shark, so to speak. So even before I dive into it, what are your thoughts on that, on the shortcut economy? Start with Katie. Yeah, I mean, the speculation is obviously rampant. I think you're absolutely right. People see things in culture. You have Dave Portnoy tweeting about stocks to his legion of, of cult followers, yeah. personal opinion. Um, but um, what we're really trying to do is, and what we really believe is that companies that make it easier to have access to investing in things like this have a, a bigger responsibility to educate and provide context. Yeah. Um, so we're 90 percent long term investors and always helping our members understand um, long term investing as a fundamental tool for wealth creation, um, which is a very different approach to investing than day trading. Most day yeah. traders statistically lose money. That's just the facts. Absolutely. Um, whereas over time, if you put your money in an ETF that matched the index, um, over 10 years, 0% of people would have lost money if they held it. And so it isn't about telling people what to do. It's about the context. So we have a lot of uh, features in the app designed to give that. We have safety labels. So there's a safety label on GameStop because it's more volatile, micro cap stocks. But there is, there's a responsibility on companies like ours. And uh, we really need to take that seriously so that people's first experience in investing isn't one where they're getting burned because they exactly. don't understand how these things work. Yeah. And I think I'll say like, I think public.com has done a great job at sort of distancing itself 
from the madness. Um, and I think, you know, that's why when you mentioned GameStop and it being a crazy year, I didn't even connect the two. I connect GameStop with Robin Hood. Um, yeah. Just because that's A, the media, but just uh, the type of people I know that kind of gravitate towards the mm -hmm. day trading. And, you know, Robin Hood's more of a gamified, uh, you know, environment that really, you know, I think, I don't want to say is predatory. Some people believe it is, but really does get people to just invest, invest, invest without really thinking about it. And there's not a whole lot of education. So it's interesting. And railing on, on a firm, you have a similar responsibility, right? Because spending is going to happen. And we're going to talk about some of the economic data coming up. That's really going to be driving just a massive increase in spending and inflation and a lot of other things that come along with it. Um, you know, how does a firm make sure that it's not making it too easy for young people to get in the debt? and things of that nature. How is that playing to your messaging? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, at the core of our company, it was founded because we saw that credit cards were contributing to this debt problem that we yeah. have in the US, right? So what we hear from consumers, and it's really interesting, um, and we're trying to separate ourselves from this idea of buy now, pay later, because it's not buy now, pay later. It's buy now and pay over time with a payment plan that works for your budget. And when we talk to the people that use a firm, it's not people that you know are trying to spend with beyond their means. It's people that are actually really savvy about their finances and they're looking for better ways to budget and they're looking for better ways to still get the things that they want, sure. but a payment plan that works for them or they're not overextending themselves. Yep. Um, yep. So I think to your question around though, how do we think about this when it comes to younger people and investing so at a firm, not everyone who applies for an firm loan gets approved, right? We have to check their credit score. We want to make sure that we are lending to people that can actually, you know, really afford to, to pay for these things on time. Um, and so there, there definitely is something happening on the back end. I think from a marketing perspective, we are focusing more on making sure we're we're saying, you know, this is a tool in addition to your toolkit of how you pay for right. things. Which is how you should be doing it. Exactly. So it, it's not the, the end all be all, but really an alternative to credit cards, which we saw, you know, with compound interest with, you know, allowing you to buy everything you want on your credit card. Um, a lot of consumers have run into that. And, and that does kind of exacerbate the problem when it comes to consumer debt. And at a firm, we really feel like, you know, we're an alternative to that, to that scenario um, so that you yeah. have control and visibility of your payments um, so that you are spending more responsibly. Totally makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. I think that, I think both approaches are very sound. And I think that's why we thought you, both of you would be great guests for today, just to talk about it through the lens of what's best for the consumer. Obviously you guys have thriving businesses, so it's, it's always a balancing act uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, obviously Americans have been known to struggle with personal finances. Uh, we've seen just massive shifts going, go on throughout the pandemic. Um, aggregate household debt, aggregate household debt balances increased by 206 billion um, in Q4 of 2020. Q4, I would imagine, always has an increase in debt balances due to holiday spending. Um, and also auto and student loans increased, uh, respectively. We're seeing, obviously, a huge push in the auto market. It was just announced this morning that used uh, car, sale, uh, use car um, sales are up, I think, like 80%. And the price of used cars are up 10% month over month, which is just crazy and leads to uh, you know some of the inflationary conditions we're going to be talking about. Um, obviously, Americans still own a, owe a ton on credit cards, um, over $807 billion. Uh, so credit cards are obviously a huge part of American culture. Um, and you know it's a big part of how a lot of consumers fun, fund and fuel their lifestyle. So yes, it's a lot of debt, but you know, all that being said, the consumer is in a much better shape now than they have been um, in years past, at least as of today, because I do think there are some massive um, kind of swirls that are going on in the broader economic environment, which could make what seems like a pretty rosy forecast for the consumer right now, something that can get a lot more bleak in probably six to 12 months, and we'll talk about that. Um, but you know, there's a new historical low in terms of uh, bankruptcy with consumers. So m less consumers are, go are going bankrupt, less consumers are getting foreclosed on. Uh, and that's something that we probably wouldn't have thought would have been the case when we were entering the pandemic, when there was talk about this being the next great depression, right? You know, we went from a time where people were, uh, you know, I, I sent a tweet out a couple of weeks ago where it was like March, 2020, I can't find toilet paper anywhere. Do you know where I can find some? To March 2021, I'm going to buy a JPEG NFT for $21,000. <laughs> like the, the shift that we've seen 
has been kind of dramatic, a whip, whiplash effect uh, in many, uh, you know, many instances. Um, household income surged in March 2021 um, as people went back to work, and you know, many uh, businesses that maybe were shuttering or running furloughs started to not only hire but promote consumers as the job market got way more competitive, and the personal savings rates uh, are really at a level that we really haven't seen. Now, obviously, it spiked to a massive level in the heart of the pandemic because people really didn't have anywhere to spend money uh, at all. And But even with a dramatic drop-off, as the pandemic has gotten, at least here in America, more under control, they're still at rates near 15% that we've never really seen before. You know, U.S. Uh, savings rates amongst consumers, uh, at least for the past 15, 20 years, have been between 5 and 10% pretty consistently. And to see that shoot up to 35% and really level off around 15 shows how much pent-up demand there likely is with the consumer. Um, so if I'm a firm, if I'm public, I'm probably, you know, looking forward to some pretty good performance ahead because people are going to be spending more. They do have more savings. They want to put that money to work. So it creates great opportunities uh, for both businesses. Um, you know, we so one thing we're going to be talking about is what role brands can play in helping Americans manage their personal finance. And we're going to be digging into three areas and probably varying and getting into more discussions as well. But one where people struggle um, to their, the need for consumers, especially younger consumers, to have financial allies. And then three, a look into the future. What is the future uh, of personal finance? Um, so one area, obviously, where consumers struggle is with savings. 75% uh, of the consumers we spoke to said they do save money for the future. However, when we asked them where their spending goes, they said 75% of their spending actually goes to fixed expenses, which shows me that their ability to increase their savings is somewhat limited because if 75% of their expenses are fixed, you know, there's not much movement they have to cut um, some of that, uh, you know, spending. Um, I don't know if either of you have any thoughts just in terms of how, you know, brands, either your brands or brands in general can help consumers think a little bit more about savings. So I think that's an interesting, I remember when I got the very first iPhone, I just remembered if I just would have bought Apple stock instead of that iPhone, you know, <laughs> it'd be a whole different story. So uh, any thoughts on that in terms of savings being a struggle point for consumers in general? I think there's some, definitely something to, um, as people learn about investing, they realize that they can support companies they believe in in other ways beyond shopping at that store. Um, there's also research that shows if people own even a little bit of stock in a company, they're more likely to be a customer. So there's interesting wow. correlations between being a, a retail investor and a consumer of a product. Um, but I think a lot of it, too, is if you have a broad audience, is um, kind of being able to read the room with this stuff. Um, I think a lot of financial products assume a lot of people have disposable income, assume they don't have debt, you know, put $10,000 in this account and get 500 back, like sounds great, who right. has that? Um, so the reality of America is that most people don't. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I think that is a key thing in the messaging of, of just financial topics is really understanding the reality. I think the median household income is what, $45,000? And right. some of these financial products still market like everyone's making six figures. Um, yeah. So and it's you see it like during Super Bowl ads, E Trade would advertise during the Super Bowl and talk a language where this is the most public event that you could have with the widest possible demographic, and the language doesn't really apply to I would say ninety five percent of the you know the consumer audience they're targeting. Yep. So I don't know Ray Lance, yeah, you have anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, I would say. Um, I think what's tricky and what I hear from consumers is there's just so much information out there. They're really um, left to their own devices when it comes to figuring out, you know, how much should I be saving? How much should I be spending? And I think, I think at the end of the day, and it kind of ties to your comment around, you know, how, how can we help young people? It does come back to education. And I don't think in the US we have a strong um, curriculum to 100%. really set people up success once they, you know, enter the real world. And I think that this is seen across generations, but I think in particular for younger ones, because they have so much access to information, it can sometimes be a, a double-edged sword where, yes, they have more resources, but knowing what are the resources to trust and who to go to is is always a challenge. Um, 
You are so, so right. I, I mean, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, kids are taught calculus in K through 12, but they're not taught how to use a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, right? They're taught how to identify different types of leads, right? But they're not taught how to save and budget. And when you think about practicality and the things that younger people really need, especially now because younger people are growing up faster than ever, they're getting a phone in their hand, which allows them to purchase anything at any time faster than ever. So education early and often about financial well-being, I think, is something that's a huge opportunity and really a big miss by, I think, the traditional education system. For sure. Um, obviously, yeah, you know, we're seeing uh, and starting to creep, but uh, the consumer price index today uh, blew away people's expectations in terms of the rise of costs of everything from cars to food to general services. Um, we are definitely entering an inflationary environment where the cost of things is going to continue to go up. Uh, the dollar is getting weaker. Uh, the country is obviously spending a lot on stimulus. They're printing a lot of money. They're putting a lot of money into the population. And we are going to, I think, all be surprised by all of a sudden something that we thought cost $20 is going to cost $40. And um, a lot of people aren't, I think, budgeting and thinking about things that way. Um, I think it should invest. Obviously, it's going to impact their investing strategy. Um, interest rates are going to go up when interest rates are going to go up. Um, ultimately technology stocks are going to go down. It just happens that way because technology stocks grow by borrowing. A lot of technology stocks don't make money for a while and they have to borrow. And if borrowing is more expensive, their growth is going to slow down. So the hot, cool stocks that people have bought maybe for the last three or four years might be the boring ones that we're going to have to see moving forward. The companies that, you know, um, you know, get, deal with gasoline or cyclicals or commodities and things of that nature, which younger investors know nothing about. So I think we're entering a, a big, I think, swirl of change. I think obviously 2020 was, was crazy for the consumer. I think 2021 is going to be a whole different type of crazy in ways. I think many, I think a lot of people think we're just going to ride off in the sunset with a, with a roaring 20 style recovery. And there will be some of that. And everyone is very excited that the, you know, the vaccines are going out, et cetera. I think at the same time, a lot of consumers are going to be facing things that they've never thought about before um, as a result of us coming out of this. So that's going to be interesting to see. And I think it's going to be a big opportunity for companies to educate um, as well. Um, saving for the future is a lot of different definitions. Uh, when we ask people, what are they saving for? 43% um, of retirement, uh, emergencies, which is a good thing. And I think the pandemic, if it showed us nothing, it's that emergencies can happen at any time. Uh, obviously, big purchases and then big life events like weddings are what consumers alluded to in terms of what is saving for the future uh, means for you. And there's a lot of great tools out there that um, are trying to make it more programmatic and sort of uh, remove the friction from saving. Uh, there's a company called Acorn, which I think, and I know the founder, Noah Kerner, quite well, um, who's built, I think, a great um, startup, which basically makes it easy for consumers to round up their spending. So if you buy something for $3.43, uh, it rounds it uh, up to $4 and the extra um, you know, pennies add up over time. And next thing you know, you log in, you have a couple thousand dollars in your account um, because it doesn't make you have to think about saving. And I think saving is something that probably isn't intuitive to a lot of people. So many people need forced savings. Obviously, a 401k is a version of that. But something like Acorns, I think it's a great tool and something that uh, I think younger, especially younger consumers and really consumers of all ages should really look at. What, what, have, you, have you guys heard of Acorn and, and, and tools like that? And what are your thoughts on that? Start with Rayling. Yes, I have. It's actually interesting because I think um, what we're seeing is some of these more traditional banks getting into, um, I think, better being more available for consumers. So I think it was yeah. um, Chase released a or came out with a new product that was really just geared towards younger people. So um, I think they had you had to have your parents sign off on it, but like kind of gamifying this idea of saving. So yep. So children could get into the habit of putting money away, watching that grow over time. I think the younger you can start for a consumer, the better, because then you're just integrating that that concept and idea into their everyday lives versus I think for a lot of millennials, we're all like, I, I don't have any savings. What should I be doing now? Right. Um, or or I do, saving, it's, it's only to the new Nike sneaker drop and that there goes my savings. Right. So it's savings yeah. for that short term dopamine hit of buying something right away. And th that's a society yeah. that we have here in America, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's centered on the consumer, it's centered on consumption, and a lot of kids do that. And I think there's room for that too, but. 
Katie, any thoughts on tools like yeah. Acorn and other types of companies that do what they do? Yeah, I'm familiar with Acorns. I think it's a great it's a great business. It's super smart. The best way to kind of make a habit more concrete is to automate the behavior. Um, so there's a lot of automated fintech companies out there that just it just becomes part of your your day to day life and you don't think about it. Um, our model is a little more hands on and like people can use both. And that's the thing about these products to understand is it's yeah. People have multiple products they're using. It's not a winner take all. Um, for us, we believe that there is a level of education that takes place when you are actually the one More actively active. doing right. it. Yeah. Even if it's long term and adding, um, there's a different layer. It's kind of like learning a language versus in school and you're at your desk memorizing words versus going to, to Madrid yes. and not understanding what they're saying. Um, but like, this is a great, I think this is a great tool, especially, and there's a lot of FinTech companies that are targeting Gen Z, like teenagers, even, I think that's great. Um, and really interesting things happening with the creators they're working with, because I think what is an optimistic kind of view of um, young people is that the creators they're looking up to are seen not just as creators, but entrepreneurs. And these kids are watching Absolutely. them actually build businesses, invest in companies. And that's even just great for general education of how this stuff works for a young person. Yeah. I mean, at a certain point, being an entrepreneur became cool again, uh, you know, with the dot com boom. And I think people do like, I think many young people, I think, believe that it just comes easily and it doesn't come without hard work going back to the shortcut economy. But I do think you're right. Being an entrepreneur is culturally relevant again. And I think that definitely comes along with all of this. And it's just interesting overall when I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about just the financial services sector, which for many years was like one of the last sectors to be disrupted. You know, you think about the healthcare space, you think about the education space, think about the finance space. Those are three highly regulated, slow, bureaucratic sectors that I would argue have been very slow to be disrupted um, from a digital standpoint. And the thing that stunned on me when you think about the financial services sector is disruption isn't always happening from the boardrooms. But when you look at the GameStop or you look at crypto or things like it's happening from the sidewalks. Consumers are are speaking with their wallets and their behaviors, and it's almost forcing this disruption. Uh, because for a while, it was too regulated for companies like yours to even be able to easily launch. And now you're seeing a flurry of activity in fintech, and it's really exciting. Yep. For sure. Um, younger people find personal finance more intimidating than older people, obviously. A big reason why is that I, I think it's a lack of education when you're earlier. I think, again, they're educated on a lot of things that are far less practical than being able to manage your money and save um, on the long term. Um, there are lots of tools out there. You know, we just talked about Acorn. Uh, my kids use a tool called Current, um, which is a kind of a credit card that they use where it's not a credit card. It's a prepaid debit card where I can track their spending. They, they get their allowance over it. Um, they can pay with their phone. They can pay with this debit card. And I think it's another great tool to, to show kids and they can actually look at what they're spending. If they're spending their allowance, they can see what they're spending it on. And I think that type of education is, is uh, you know, very critical for them. And I think those tools are, are quite valuable. Um, so, you know, Katie, you talked about public and kind of the community based approach, because I think community is important um, for education as well, because it shouldn't just be one to many. It should be many to many. And I know you guys have done a great job, particularly about kind of, you know, activating communities. So can you talk a little bit about that and why it's been successful? Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick because I don't want to be too self-promotional. Uh, no but <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the community, the way we view community is very different from Wall Street Bets, Reddit, sort right. of where it's kind of let's all collude or get together and, and move something. This is much more collaborative. It's not competitive. It's not about flexing. You know, you see a lot of screenshots. You only see the wins on those forums. Um, and it's broader conversations, not just about investing, but investing in the context of budgeting, saving, paying off loans, you know, all those topics around um, your personal, your personal finance, because investing is really just a, a piece of that. Um, and so the tone is very much educational in nature. And um, I think another thing that our community does is just offer representation where it hasn't previously exist. Um, you see, you still see ads all the time from some of these legacy players that every person in the ad looks like either my dad or my uncle. Um, and you don't, when, you know, over time, if you don't see yourself in these communities and then in these environments, it does create like a psychological barrier. Yeah, to you're disenfranchised for you. So right. 
that's that's really what we're trying to do in the role community plays at public. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great strategy for sure. Um, most people have at least some experience with saving and budgeting, which is good. But I think, again, a lot of it isn't really as intentional as perhaps it should be. Um, a lot of consumers, even ones who are gainfully employed and have a 401k, still don't fully understand what a 401k means, still don't fully understand uh, what it means to have a mortgage or invest. And you know, these are all opportunities for companies in the space. One thing we saw during the pandemic is that consumers actually said they trusted brands more than they did the government for information about COVID-19. And that, I mean, that was shocking to me, but maybe not so um, if you think about it. But, um, you know, I think it just goes to show the opportunity and in some ways the responsibility uh, that brands have to be true leaders and not just focus um, on their bottom line, but try to, um, you know, think about the consumer on a more of a long term basis and know that that will pay back um, eventually. Um, there's definitely a gender gap with all of this. Um, you know, speaking to two very successful women in the financial services space, I'm sure you all have, uh, you both have, um, you know, a, a lot to say just about the gender gap when it comes to targeting um, women from these traditional banks and really the, the opportunities that should be afforded. I'll start with you, Rayling. What are your thoughts on that um, in terms of really empowering women from a financial standpoint? Yeah. Uh, this is a really, really good question, but I feel like we could probably spend the entire presentation know, talking about. Right. Um, but I, I think I can speak from personal experience with this. I think, um, and a firm is a wonderful culture, by the way. Like we have women ERGs. Um, our our executive leadership team is is so supportive in making sure that women, um, you know, do have leader pres leadership positions. But I do think I notice a difference personally with my friend groups with kind of the things that my my girlfriends and I talk about versus my when I hear my partner and his friends talk about right. things. And I think for for culturally for women, we haven't always um, maybe felt as comfortable talking about money with one another in the ways that I do see kind of my partner and his friends talk about investments and financing. And so I think part of that is kind of growing up in a society where we are still in, still coming off of traditional roles for men and women where, you know, um, women were, you know, uh, housewives and, and, you know, men were the breadwinners and, and we're seeing that shift now. But I think it's going to take some time for that to be a little bit more normalized in a way that, you know, you do see women talking about their finances, but and not being shamed for, you know, having high powered jobs or having opinions or or, you know, standing up kind of these conversations for other women, because I think naturally we're a little less, we're a little more timid to talk about these things because we're afraid that we're going to be seen as, as bossy or, um, you know, all of those, all of those negative adjectives that come to, that sometimes come with, you know, what it means to be a successful woman in our society. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Katie, anything to add to that? Yeah, sure. I think it's it's interesting. We, we talk a lot about the wage gap, but the wealth gap, when you talk about things like investing, is so much more dramatic because of compound interest over time. Yeah. Um, so if a woman is earning less, and then I think women invest something like 40% less than men, over time, I think that's like, a, on average, like a million dollars over a lifetime of a difference, which is insane. Um, and these kinds of stats are, are frustrating, not because that that's the data, that's how it is, but it's, I think the next logical step some people take is, oh, women just aren't as good at it. And it's just like bull, bull crap. Um, right. Lots of studies that actually show specifically with investing in the stock market, women have a more long-term holistic focus. And they, when they do invest, they tend to outperform, outperform men who tend to be more speculative. You know, these are generalizations, not applicable to everyone. Sure. Um, and so it isn't about capability, it's about access and um, you know, giving women representation in these spaces where they feel comfortable even getting in there. And when they do get in there, they, they succeed and they excel and they thrive. So um, I think companies kind of do need to kind of rejigger how they're, they're marketing products like ours um, and not just going to the obvious choices of you know, affluent men um, and, you know, I'd be remiss not to even call out the, the kind of class gap that exists, obviously, uh, you know, a white woman versus a woman of color, very dramatic differences yeah. there too. Um, but there's actually research I just saw in Adweek and I don't, I don't recall who came up with it, but, 
Um, it showed that ads showing more diverse um, kind of progressive images in the ads performed better. And that's because more people, it resonated with more people. And so I think we got to get out of this space where we're just going back to the obvious in the same playbook and shake it up a bit and not underestimate these groups of people who are perfectly capable of doing these things. Yeah, not to mention we have, we're having a changing demographic blueprint of America. And what America will look like five to 10 years ago is not what it looks like today. So I think a lot of these sleepy legacy incumbent institutions in the financial services space are looking at where the world was, as many companies, legacy companies do, not where it's going. And it's going to be their own detriment eventually because they're going to gloss over a rising class of professionals and future earners and, and investors. So. I think that's what one of the happen. companies. Yeah, one of the companies that I did want to mention that I actually do think is doing a phenomenal job at this is Elevest. Um, so the the founder Sally Krawcheck, she's she was um, head of I think Bank of America and has been in on Wall Street for for decades. But um, and I started investing actually in their company because oh, wow. their model takes into account the fact that women actually live longer than men. So your your time horizon is is going to be different, and the, and you want to think about how you're investing differently. But I think what I love about their platform is um, they they do think take into account all these things. You know, do you want to have children? What does that look like? Um, they also take into account like if you're going to have to take up time from work, how does that kind of in, impact kind of your your financial planning and things like that in a way that I I just don't think traditional financial institutions that were historically run by men even think about because they've never had to be in those shoes before. So right. um, I think too, there are different needs for women and men when it comes to, you know, finances and, and not having those institutions that are meeting those needs or making it worse. But there are, I do think companies out there that are addressing it and addressing it really well. Um, and to Katie's point at the end of the day, it is about access. And I think for a long time, you know, women really didn't have that kind of access or that voice or those, you know, those types of role models um, to kind of even out this, this, we, they call it an investment gap, which I agree with. Um, so we're getting there. But I, I do think that it's something that we definitely need to be talking about. Absolutely. Can I have one more thing on that. Of course, um, of course you can. I, I love Sally Krawcheck and Elvis. Um, that got me thinking about like, what does it mean to market to women? I think for brands, it and how we're approaching it is you know we're building a place for everybody and sometimes i think people are like oh i'm gonna market to women i'm gonna make the button pink it's like that's not marketing to women it's you know we're building like an agnostic environment that is is inclusive in the imagery and everything but it's not kind of this let's just change the color palette and call it a day and i think just thinking about it in that sense of not not gendering things, but just make it agnostic yeah. um, is an easy way to make you know your marketing and your products more accessible. I think it's a great point. Absolutely, it's, it's you don't have to overcorrect for it, and if you do, sometimes to your point, it becomes a little too obvious and actually can be off putting. So yeah, um, we're going to jump to the last section. I've kind of been jumping around, but I want to make sure we have time for questions, which is the future of personal finance and kind of four key trends we're seeing through our research, uh, through what we're looking at, terms of what's going on in the marketplace and get your thoughts. Uh, the first is more obviously virtual, less face to face. 62% uh, of people are open to managing their bank fully online. Um, if you think about it, you know, the, the footprint that many of these traditional banks have for physical retail spaces just don't really make sense anymore. Um, you know, the notion that someone's going to be walking down the street and pop into their local Wells Fargo to open up a mortgage is not how the modern consumer gets a mortgage. They're going to go um, online to Quicken Loans or they're going to do a Google search or uh, one of many startups, better.com. There's so many out there to find the best mortgage. Um, they, in many instances, don't need cash anymore, right? They are using Apple Pay or they're they're using their credit cards or they're using a firm or whatever it may be to purchase. So they, they don't need the ATM as much anymore. Um, customer service for banks could be done over a Zoom-based environment. So when you look at the retail landscape for banks, I mean, if I were running a bank, I would shut them all down you know, or shut most of them down tomorrow and, and, and redirect those savings towards consumer education, towards women empowerment, towards um, supporting ethnicities and minorities and, and, and trying to create uh, better opportunities. So I just, 
it's to me, it's one of those instances where so many of these big businesses are doing things the way they've always been done. But I think talk about pandemic acceleration, and that's one. I don't know if you guys had thoughts on that in terms of does it make sense for banks to even have physical spaces anymore? Neither of you have physical spaces for your businesses, right? <laughs> there Boom. you go. We're going back soon. The bank thing's interesting because I think as crypto becomes more mainstream, it's almost like the banks used to be kind of the beacon of like credibility and stability. Right. And now everyone's questioning the banks. I saw a meme that was the pen on the chain at the bank and it was like, this is how much banks trust you. And that's what that's the conversation. But I do think with the virtual, there are ways for technology to keep that human touch. Um, a quick example is I signed up for Lemonade for my new ap apartment, which is mobile insurance app. Um, they asked me, it was a chat bot that I signed up with. They had me enter my birthday. And then the bot made a joke about my astrological symbol, which was like hilarious to me. Right. So it doesn't mean you're not, you know, human. There's just, you have to build that into the tech. Of course. But convenience is huge. I mean, who, we all sit on customer service, uh, you know, hold times forever in a variety of industries. I think a lot of these new companies have, uh, you know, made it a priority for it to basically be accessible and make sure that customer service is front and center and, and they are more human um, in that uh, instance as well. Um, let me just get rid of this slide. Um, digital banking users obviously are, are growing. Digital banking is becoming huge. It used to be something that was sort of a, a, a competitive advantage for a bank to have an app. <laughs> now sort of it's commonplace. Um, many consumers also want connectivity with tools like Mint that allow them to, um, over time, you know, track how they're spending their money and, um, you know, see where their money is going. And I think, you know, now all the banks are connecting. There's tools like Plaid, uh, which have, have been very successful that have been sort of a connectivity, connective tissue between the banks and tools like Mint and other platforms as well, uh, because people want to have a firm handle of their entire financial situation. Um, and these APIs have been very valuable, uh, for that. Um, Chime is another really uh, interesting company um, in this space. I don't know, are either of you familiar with Chime? Um, so yeah, I mean, really interesting in terms of almost redefining what it means to have a credit card um, and, and trying to make it easier. Apple launched a credit card. There's many, uh, the guys, the, the Winklevi twins are, are coming up with um, a new uh, place where you can store your cryptocurrency and actually make interest on your crypto. And they're launching a credit card. Um, Gemini, I think is the name of that company. Yeah. So uh, Winkle Voss twins called the Winkle line and, and jokes and certain circles. But, uh, you know, I think the credit card space is uh, rapidly evolving as well. Um, more cashless. So we talked about that, but you know, we are entering a cashless society and I'm really interested in you railing because this is sort of like, this is right in your wheelhouse, right? Consumers. And t tell me about, a little bit about a firm. So I know that one of your bigger customers is Peloton, right? And that's obviously probably been a huge, um, you know, source of growth in the past year. But as consumers get out into more traditional retail, you have retail and merchant partners, and then that sort of offered to them at checkout. Is that how it works? Yes. So that's how, yep, absolutely. So we also partner with over 6,500 other retailers. Um, Peloton is a big one for us, obviously, because you know, that, that value prop of being able to pay for your $3,000 yeah, bike purchase, like, over right. time. Yeah. But you know, with, with a firm, it, it's more like replacing your gym membership is what we hear consumers say about it. Um, but we also partner with major retailers like Walmart and Casper and West Elm um, so that people can, you know, choose the payment plan that works for them while still getting the things that they want. Um, I thought that this uh, stat was very interesting because um, I think COVID, would really accelerated this. There are other countries um, that are way more cashless than, yeah. than we are, the UK being a good example. Um, but what's funny is we did hear from parents that for, for kids that are younger, cash is still important to them. Like they're still using cash to, to dine at restaurants, et cetera. But I think once you get to that age where you're buying bigger purchases or you want to build your credit, that's where things like using your credit card or your debit card really come into play. Um, so I don't think cash is going away completely, but I do think COVID accelerated. Yeah. A lot of people think that, that it um, germs because... too. <laughs> There's a lot of people exactly. that think that so you know, I how think many people touch this $5 bill? I don't want to touch it. So, um, <laughs> yeah. not to so I, think COVID too, I don't know if you guys, yeah, notice this, but like in San Francisco, I can say there are so many businesses now that are just going completely, um, cashless where like usually there were bars that were actually cash only, 
but now they've right. completely made a 180. So I think that this trend is, is here to stay. And just so I'm clear is, so a firm is offered not only at e-commerce, but is actually offered at brick and mortar retail as well. Is that another distribution point we are of yours? Actually, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. We are slowly but surely getting into that space. Um, there are certain merchants that we we are at brick and mortar. I know Casper is one of them, um, but I think um, we will we will be getting into that space as as yeah. consumers, particularly, are going back to stores more. Um, there is a huge opportunity to be offering it in stores, but I think we're we're still trying to figure out what that would look like. Yeah. Um, you know, one one company that has done a great job in terms of disruption in the financial services space has been Square, right? Making it easier for any merchant to be able to accept credit cards um, instantly. You know, you think about the old credit card terminals and uh, how, you know, ex expensive and inconvenient that was for merchants. And then just to be able to essentially connect an iPad to a credit card swipe machine, and all of a sudden you're, you're accepting credit cards. It, it's been sort of a revolutionary tool um, that I think is really empowering both to the merchant and the consumer. Um, in more of a cashless society. Um, you know, so 23% of respondents we spoke to are open to eliminating cash altogether um, in favor of cashless payments. Um, trend number three, crypto. So Katie, you've mentioned uh, crypto a lot in terms of a viable investment. I mean, I remember three years ago, I remember something called YPO. Um, and um, it's like a lot of CEOs from the New York area. And Jamie Dimon was speaking, um, you know, the head of JP Morgan Chase. And I asked uh, Jamie what he thought about cryptocurrency. And he literally told me he thought it was a bad and it would be gone in a year or two. And then lo and behold, last month, JP Morgan announces that their customers, their investment banking customers are able to purchase crypto. Um, and it's just, it shows that the people's will kind of rose up and here is an institution that was sort of pushing it away because it was sort of the new world. And now they're bucking the trend and as they should be offering it to consumers, 30% uh, of respondents have friends that have bought, invested in a trade in crypto card. That's a crazy number. I didn't expect it to be that high. Um, two questions on that. Katie, how important is crypto in terms of the overall strategy of public.com? Is it sort of front and center? And I guess what's your take in terms of how consumers should be looking at that given all the changes we've talked about? Yeah, I'll caveat with saying I'm not an investment advisor, so this is not investment advice. But crypto, with this stat, I, I would I would think this number would be higher even. Um, but what you see is a lot of people getting in there and not understanding blockchain, what it is, the difference between Bitcoin and you know X Y Z, Ethereum, uh, yeah. whatever yeah. coin of the day. So there's a real big education gap, much deeper than even investing in stocks. We have announced that we're going to launch crypto in the next few months. Our go-to-market is really going to be about how to view this asset class in the context of a broader investing right. strategy as a way to diversify with a ton of education about how this stuff works, like how to look at volatility um, because you are seeing just people, just like you said, the shortcut kind of culture yep. of, you know, Dogecoin, you see somebody on Reddit made, you know, a few thousand dollars in a day. You know, if, if it looks that easy, it probably isn't. And people should really understand how this stuff works. But it is interesting because even yesterday, the SEC put out guidance and they doubled down and said, this is a risky, this is right. speculative, this is risky, buyer beware. Um, so it's always that, you know, with us, it's always we want to have that. We want people to have the access. We want people to do what they will. No one's the same. Some people have a very high risk appetite. They have a lot of disposable income. Like if they want to do that, that's their prerogative. Sure. Um, but given just like the saturation and culture, the education piece is going to be even more important for any company that even broaches this topic. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not one thing's for sure. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. You know, the, the the values can fluctuate dramatically, but I think more and more institutions are going to adopt it. The biggest risk overall to crypto is that governments, we're already seeing it in China, where, you know, governments like to know who has money and where it's being spent. And crypto, in a lot of ways, doesn't enable that. Um, you probably saw there was a huge hack of a huge oil pipeline on the East Coast via ransomware. Ransomware is something that's grown dramatically because the way that these people are paid when they extort businesses is through crypto. So I yeah. think there's a, just like any other uh, evolution that happens in business, there's positive and negative implications. And it'll be interesting to see how the government, if at all, intervenes and stops 
what seems to be like a wild ride for uh, you know the adoption of of cryptocurrency. Um, uh, and lastly, you know the basics are the most powerful future. And I think Katie, you had mentioned this is our last point, but you know that many businesses sort of miss the basics, explaining things not in what I call financial lease but real human terms. And what's more true than ever before is the consumer has a limited attention span. You know, we are built, we have to be built for the flick. Consumers are constantly scrolling through their mobile devices with many other things going on. And they're simply not going to take the time to read a lot of copy or language or try to understand something that's so far away. So I think both of your businesses, ultimately, you know, the opportunity is how do you simplify you know, how do you simplify the act of making products, uh, you know, more accessible by paying over time? Or how do you simplify the notion of investing and not put it in languages that are intimidating the consumers, especially new and younger investors that haven't really been thinking about it um, in the past? Um, and I think, you know, some companies like Coinbase, who recently just went public, massive valuation, have done a great job at sort of simplifying crypto investing. And I think that's a big reason uh, they've been so successful. So um, we only have a couple minutes left. So I want to bring on Abel, um, who I like to call the Ryan Seacrest of the uh, of the Suzy webinar series to kind of go through. Also younger and better looking than Ryan Seacrest. I, I, <laughs> um, but uh, to, to go through some of the questions that we're getting from our audience. So thanks so much, uh, Abel, for joining. Of course. And Matt, you are, you are too kind there. Um, <laughs> So one thing I think is kind of interesting, but um, among a lot of people, among young people, one of the barriers to investing is just how intimidating it can be just from that initial onset. Uh, it can feel risky and people don't trust um, that they'll know what's going on or how they can sell things. So maybe this question is really for Katie, like how are you guys kind of overcoming of that? Um, how are you guys thinking about education when it comes to kind of financial investment literacy? Yeah, people are scared of what they don't understand or feel like they can't understand. And so it's about breaking that psychological barrier to entry. Um, for us, with the community aspect of our product, it's kind of about social proof. We have a lot of um, entrepreneurs on there, Tony Hawk's on the app, um, different people you might recognize who still have that kind of entrepreneurial slant or maybe they're an investor and they just make this stuff way more relatable. In addition, you have your own friends in there, which just make having conversations about investing um, more more human and more accessible than you know reading a, a bunch of Investopedia articles, which is still helpful. Again, it's just speaking the language in the actual context. So maybe you're in a chat group on the day the Coinbase IPO, and you're talking about what you're seeing, and somebody talks about the price going up. There you go. You just learned about what an IPO pop is. Um, and so it is about that in context conversation to help educate people along the way. Definitely. Um, and actually, maybe even thinking a little bit about education when it comes to younger uh, audiences, obviously, a lot of the young generations on TikTok, and that becomes a lot of place for discovery uh, and understanding. So have you guys seen any really strong uh, movement towards using TikTok uh, as a platform for financial service companies to educate people? Um, I don't know, Rayleigh, you're, you're, you're shaking your head. So maybe you have a thought on that. Yeah, um, it is something that we talk about in the marketing organization around, you know, what channels do we want to be on, in what capacity. I think I can speak from personal experience with TikTok. It's an interesting platform because you're able to really synthesize what exactly you want someone to take away from something. I was just browsing randomly and came across someone who gives all this advice on investment properties and that type of content, you know, didn't exist before and he makes it look so easy. And right. obviously, you know, it's, it's a big financial decision, but that channel and the way that it's structured and designed actually lends itself to, I think, a lot of these education moments, which actually is very powerful because consumers are not making these decisions in a vacuum, you know, in one instance, um, buying an investment property that takes months of planning and thought, but having different types of mediums for where they're getting that information and, and seeing, you know, how to do it being reinforced by multiple channels, um, I think is really great. Um, I think the only danger is, and I'm sure consumers feel this way too, is like, can you really trust these people that are kind of making a business out of, out of these moments? Um, but I think it's still, still a really interesting mo uh, medium to educate that I don't really necessarily see on Instagram or Facebook as much. We, we work with a lot of TikTokers um, and it's interesting because vetting becomes very, very important as a brand. 
um, to find the people that are using the format in that innate sort of explainer style way in a, in a thoughtful way. It's well researched. Um, it's responsible um, versus what Rayling was saying, kind of this hustle porn of like, I made a million dollars in one year. Check out my house. Be like me. Like there, there's a kind of gradient there and it's on brands to do the, the work and, and find the right people. But we've found a lot of great people who are making really, really good, trustworthy content in this area. Um, and so I do think you see a lot of people, there's a Twitter account called TikTok investors making fun of some of those people. Um, but that's that's not the kind of the full picture. There's really great people there if you dig a little bit. Definitely. Um, so obviously we've, we've talked a lot about people making money um, via financial products, but uh, one person had a question about how do you guys see philanthropy um, you know, among this younger generation um, beyond just kind of making money on your various platforms or spending it. Um, I don't know if either of you have a, a thought on that one. I, uh, I can't really speak to philanthropy, but what we do see in our app with younger consumers and we've done research ourselves on this is that people want to um, invest in companies that align with their values. So they're looking into what's in the consumer staple ETF they're invested in. Oh, yep. you know, a gun manufacturer, an arms dealer. Um, and they also want to support businesses that have diverse leadership. The Bumble IPO was extremely popular in our app because a lot of people wanted to be a part of that moment of the youngest woman to take a company public. And so people are adding that layer of does this, do I feel good about investing in this company? Not just will this company make me money? Yeah, Definitely. I can say um, internally, we talk about this a lot at a firm and one of our company values is people come first. So when, you know, everything was happening um, and still ha happening with, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of the things that are happening like with India and their COVID cases, a firm, our employees really gather around that and we donate um, money to these organizations to really think about how we are giving back to the community. We have a whole team dedicated to this. So for us, it's more about, you know, how are we really um, walking the walk? And, and the way we do that is really by, you know, we're a very successful company and a lot of people that I think are dedicating the resources that they've, you know, either made through the, the IPO or what have you to, to kind of really give back to the community in that way. Um, so I feel very fortunate to work for a company that actually prioritizes those things and, and puts a spotlight on these social issues and is not sweeping these things under the rug. Um, so that's how we we kind of approach it at a firm. Awesome. Uh, well, we are right at time at two o'clock, but I want to say thank you all for, for joining us. It's been very interesting just to hear, um, especially as a rising millennial, how these kind of things will continue to impact my life. Yeah, absolutely, Abel. Thanks as always for joining, uh, and to our guests, Railing uh, from a firm and Katie from Public dot com. Thank you guys again for joining. You obviously have a lot of insights, and I have no doubt each of you will continue to be successful uh, in this space. So, on behalf of myself and Abel and the whole Susie team, thanks for joining our latest edition of Susie State of the Consumer Webinar. We'll be back uh, with plenty more um, over the summer, so please stay tuned. So, until then, stay safe, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.